testimony to the passion for education of our first forebears that the founding of our first college only slightly trails the founding of our first colony. After God had carried us safe to New England, they explained, and we had builded our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places of worship of God, and settled the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity. Why this great priority and urgency of a college for so small a community of slender resources struggling for sustainability precariously perched on the edge of a howling wilderness? Quite simply, they must have a college because they could not be without competent ministers of the gospel. We dreaded, as they put it, to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. And so, in 1636, Harvard College was founded and furnished precisely to meet that necessity. It was to be a place where, foremost, a succession of a learned and able ministry might be educated. Hence, it comes as no surprise that the core curriculum included Hebrew, Chaldee, and Syriac, and that the daily exercises engaged the students in rendering Old Testament Hebrew into New Testament Greek and then back again. Whether or not the student was destined for the ministry, the goal of a Harvard education remained unwavering. As the college statutes expressed it, everyone shall consider the main end of his life and studies, to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Study with reverence and love, students were directed, carefully to retain God and his truth. It was this ambition of Harvard to retain God and his truth which became controversial. Not the aim, rather Harvard's success in fulfilling it. By century end, New Englanders were naming their children Ichabod, the glory has departed, and noting with dismay that Harvard, that intended school of the prophets, was turning out degenerate graduates whose religion was not pure and undefiled, a sad token of paradise lost. Taking up the torch from the faltering hand of fallen Harvard, ten Connecticut ministers in 1701 gathered in a parsonage and recalling the glorious design of our blessed fathers both to plant and propagate in this wilderness the blessed reform Protestant religion, jointly resolved to erect a college pursuant of that grand errand. The vision had shoe leather, for they each had brought with them some prize volumes to contribute to the undertaking. Each stepped forward and in turn placed their offering upon a table, solemnly intoning, I give these books for the founding of a college in this colony. One historian refers to these books as dusty theological volumes. They were not dusty and their owners would have rather parted with ten cords of cut wood. They represented the heritage of faith they had received and sought to pass on without adulteration. As with Harvard, Yale's express aim was more than education, more even than an education in divinity. It was, one might say, spiritual. Each incoming student was greeted with a directive from the pen of the president Above all, have an eye to the great end of all your studies, which is to obtain the clearest conceptions of divine things and to lead you to a saving knowledge of God in his Son, Jesus Christ. Or in the words of the first college rules, every student shall consider the main end of his duty to wit, to know God in Jesus Christ and answerably to lead a godly, sober life. Such a profile, a godly, sober life, was thought by many a Yale alumnus to have been epitomized by the young David Brainerd, would-be class of 1742. The irony was that he was expelled for his spiritual fervor. It was Yale's treatment of Brainerd which convinced many a concerned alumnus that their alma mater was now, alas, wayward, and another college would be needed to cultivate godly leaders. And indeed, the need for godly ministers was at the time especially acute. The Great Awakening had spawned new churches, filled old ones to overflowing, and stretched revivalists beyond their capacities to feed the burgeoning flocks. 
Accounts describe the cries of ministers oppressed with labors and of congregations famished for want of the sincere milk of the word, along with urgent applications made by pastorless congregations deprived of the ordinary means of salvation and left to grope after happiness almost in the obscurity of paganism. These longings after the bread of life were the urgent arguments and immediate motives for the founding of the College of New Jersey, 1746, later Princeton, with the principal end being to raise up pious and learned ministers, the likes of Brainerd, to stand in the gap. In the words of Governor Belcher, who granted Princeton's charter, and but for his self-effacing modesty, Nassau Hall would have been known by his name, he writes, uh, we, what we all aim at in the founding of this college is the advancing the kingdom and the interests of the blessed Jesus and the general good of mankind. <clears throat> Neither did this founding vision quickly vanish. As President McLean reiterated in 1877, may Princeton ever be regarded as an institution consecrated to the service of God for the defense of revealed truth and for the promotion of fervent piety and sound learning. <clears throat> 